what I think is an extremely important topic. Um, I know it's not easy to, to put years of study and research and practice into a half an hour presentation, but you managed to do so. Um, so we have been a long journey, and uh, I've had the opportunity to revise your uh, thesis multiple times. Um, I think I saw the first version about two years ago now, and, and I revised it several times over the course of the past uh, two years. And I am very much aware that I've not made it easy uh, on you. And um, <laughs> I, I would apologize for it, because I think it was, it was important. But I also think that the, the reworked version of your thesis is a substantial improvement to the, the first and the and second versions. Um, so thank you for your perseverance and for hanging in there. Um, as you, you could take from me, a thesis is much more than just demonstrating that you can publish articles. Um, it is a, that is for me not a product of a PhD. The product of a PhD is you. It's a, it's a person. I think at the end of the person, uh, the process, uh, the result of the piece that is not your book or articles, but it, it is a well-trained, critically thinking person that can independently uh, do trustworthy research. Uh, so this is what we will put to the test today as well. And I have uh, a number of questions for you. Let's see uh, how much time uh, people will give me to, to ask these questions. But, uh, I have two sets, two big questions, two sets of big questions, and, and two small questions for you. Uh, and my first set of big questions relates to the conceptual framework that you have used. So you opted to work with the um, information motivation of the EFL skills model as the, the overarching conceptual framework for your thesis. And I have several questions related to that, that framework. So I want to know from you why is it important for you to use the conceptual framework? Um, how was this model that you've chosen uh, used throughout the thesis uh, and in the interpretation of your results? What are your personal thoughts on the strengths and weaknesses of the conceptual framework? Uh, and which other frameworks did you consider to use? And in hindsight, would you, would you have taken another choice or would you, or would you have made, uh, made uh, adaptations or improvements to the, the framework? I can repeat the questions as we go. I know it's, uh, it's a lot. Um. Thank you very much, Professor Mikkelsen. I think that your rigorous questioning and, and changes to the proposal and even the thesis have made it a lot better. I'm now a better critical thinker, so thank you very much. And I chose to use the IBM model because as a service provider, these are areas where I would spend more time and also impact on the outcomes. I don't think I would have used a better model for this particular thesis because there were very many studies attached together and eventually the outcome was looking at how these adolescents are going to survive and also prevent onward transmission of HIV. So this was a convenient model. Did you consider any other models? Um, honestly, no. Okay. Mm. Uh, and and why, why did you find it important to use a model as such? And how did you use it throughout, throughout the study? So, throughout the study, the various, um, the various factors which eventually affect these adolescents were could fit into the model, and that's why it was used throughout. For example, if the adolescents were found, the structural factors, if the adolescents were, were found in, um, in a place where they, they didn't have uh, adolescent-friendly clinics, then they were very unlikely to be socially supported. And the clinics where we worked mostly had a policy of disclosure disclosure to the adolescents themselves and then subsequently disclosed to other people. And disclosure was a critical factor that we used which would help them adhere better to their treatment if they were sexually active, inform their other uh, their partners or sexual partners. So it was something that could easily be used throughout all the papers. Okay. Well, do you see any weakness in our choice of model as well? And 
Sorry, Christine, you have to repeat that question. Uh, sorry, uh, so I just wanted to know if you also see some weaknesses in the model that you have used, and if you would make a look at that and the studies that you've done, would you have made any changes? Um, if, if each study was looked at independently, perhaps we would have used other theoretical models. For example, the different models that we used or looked at in the adolescent sexual risk reduction papers, those were more detailed um, social studies. But as you know, I'm not a social scientist, so I couldn't dwell deep into those. But certainly, yeah. there are factors that could have, there are other models that could have been used. And I've read some of your work. I know that you've evaluated different models and frameworks to, to see if the interventions that we use to improve adolescent health in general work. So, yeah. I know there would have been better models. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, my, my second set of questions regard, uh, is, is related to the methodologies that you have used, and, and more specifically to two, two specific parts in the methodology, throughout the, the different studies that you have uh, published. Um, and I have two main questions regarding the, or questions or concerns, or I would like to, to hear your thoughts on two, on two issues regarding the methodology. Since I, I felt, and I was reading the, the thesis um, in the past week, I felt that uh, in, in almost all studies, the selection of um, respondents was not clearly described. Sometimes you say it's a purposive sample, sometimes it's really not explained who was approached, who was selected. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really not so clear who is in your study. And why were they selected, how were they selected, and what is the impact of, of um, the way you selected the respondents on the results? So that's uh, the first part that I would like you to, to reflect on. Um, how were they selected, why, and, and what are the implications of this, this uh, selection strategy for, on the results? And the second part that I, I felt was um, somewhat lacking or not not super well described in the articles is the description of the measures that you use in your studies. So you mentioned concepts like high pilgrim, forgetfulness, um, even adherence. For me, it's not super well explained in the, in, in the papers why you opted for certain measures, how you measured it um, specifically. So I would also like to hear your thoughts on, on what the implications are of um, not described measures um, or of the measures that you used uh, on the results of your work. Uh, thank you very much for those questions. First of all, um, as I say, these were a conglomerate of five different papers, and they were really selected purposefully to tell a story. And the first patients who we followed were adolescents who were being initiated on antiretroviral therapy. So those who are being initiated on antiretroviral therapy was consecutively enrolled and they had to accept consent ETC. And in that first paper for the adherence paper, we used a different types to assess their adherence. In particular, we used the pill count, we used the visual analog scale, and we counted the pills for all the time that they came. For the other papers, the qualitative papers, we described adherence differently. In particular, we use the adherence, um, case adherence index, and in the case adherence index, which I guess is sometimes subjective, you ask the adolescent, um, what are the adherence difficulties that you face, what are the frequencies of missing your treatment, and one, what time or date was the last treatment missed. And then we computed the score indexes into good or poor adherence. Obviously, these are all very subjective. I know that today we have better methods of assessing adherence, 
in that we are able to do um, their viral load monitoring. And if a patient is adhering well to treatment, then they will virally suppress. So adherence is, a, is I think, a fluid definition that keeps changing, but we need clear, objective ways to assess it. And for me, I think viral load assessment is the best. So in terms of the um, implications, that if an adolescent comes and subjectively tells you that they've adhered well to their treatment, and you believe them, then that is what you're going to go with. And in these uh, different papers, as we assess their adherence, we believed what they said, because that is how our questionnaire was structured. If I were to do this study again, I would look at viral load critically and compare it to the subjective way that adherence was reported. Now, give me a suggestion. Um, I would like to go back to the, the selection of, of participants because you, you touched upon it and you mentioned again that, that you selected participants purposefully. Uh, but can you explain that further? For what purpose? Why, uh, why, is it, why, why did so, you approach certain or I, I should have actually, I should have said it was a convenient sample for the first paper, that those were the ones available to start on antiretroviral therapy. But as we continue to follow up these patients, those who um, were available to join the qualitative studies were aged between 13 and 17, because those are the ones that fitted into the adaptative study for the healthy choices. It was intended for 13 to 17 years of age. And then for the other study where we were looking at um, we were looking at disclosure choices. We were in the transition clinic, and this is a much older cohort. So those who consented to join the, the, the studies were the ones who were taken. But we had inclusion and exclusion criteria. But most importantly, those who joined the study were those who had been disclosed to of their HIV status, so that we didn't do accidental disclosure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have uh, two small questions still. I, I'm looking at the chair of the jury to see if I can still ask them. Yes. Um, one, one is uh, also a logic, methodological question. So you mentioned in one of your papers that you um, reached date saturation. Um, so you had, uh, I think, one focus group and 20 interviews um, in the article and you mentioned that you have reached saturation, so you stopped recruitment of, of um, additional participants. How did you determine that you reached saturation? What techniques did you use? Um, so because this was qualitative, we continued to explore the possibilities of answering, of the answers given to us. And when the answers were repeated, then we felt that we had reached saturation. So after, after how many interviews did you didn't find any, any additional data and new, new information? No, these were responses to the different questions. Yeah. Um, okay. And my, my final question is on the recommendations. And, and uh, I know that this is well in your presentation, which is now that you, you write that you have recommendations for researchers, policy makers, healthcare providers, program managers, and adolescents. Um, now, I only see a few of these which are presented in your, in your actual recommendations. And I would like to know what your recommendations are for adolescents themselves. You mentioned that you have them, but you haven't see, I, I couldn't see in any other recommendations what you are actually recommending, recommending for young people themselves. Um, thank you very much. And just to let you know that in the room here physically, we do have some adolescents who may not be HIV infected. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we, we feel that engaging them at all times in decision making, in planning, is very important for them. I also feel that as we train these adolescents to be responsible for their own health, they need to be part of the planning. So adolescents in the room, be part of the planning process, but also adolescents elsewhere who could be listening to this discussion, 
they need to be part of the conversation. And in Uganda, we've gone ahead to have peer-to-peer -peer support programs um, supported by the PATA program. We also have, um, have adolescents on community advisory boards, so they need to be engaged and involved. And in the psychosocial support group, we use developmental um, assessment and support to encourage them to move from the younger adolescents to the middle adolescents to the older adolescents so that they can have the confidence to discuss within their own groups. So empowering them is empowering others. Okay, that's clear. Thank you. Thank you for the three years of the questioning. Uh, and now invite Dr. Luke Burgess uh, to ask uh, uh, questions. I'm sorry, we cannot hear you. Just uh, can you uh, switch on the mic, please? because of the care that you provide already for so many years to a group of uh, people, which is in fact the future of, a, of your country, which, which is severely deprived. Uh, I think it is great that you do research in this group and that you can better the care that you give to them. The second part of my appreciation is for your science, because it's, it, it will have uh, errors and things that you could do better, of course, but I think it is great that you could combine so many different uh, methods, uh, qualitative as quantitative, and overall it looks sound and it gives you information, which I hope will help you to ameliorate your care for the children you are caring, or the adolescents and the upcoming adults. That was my appreciation, I wanted to start with. The questions I have, uh, some small questions. Uh, in your first study, you measured sexual maturation in children on ART, and you mentioned that there was a, difference, a significant difference when you looked at six months, but not anymore at 12 months. And I just wondered what was then your reference? Did you look back twice to the starting point, or did you look back at the point at six months? So, thank you very much for the appreciation. I promise that we shall continue to work hard, even in our resource-limited setting. Now, in terms of sexual maturation, we looked at Turner staging, and for the Turner staging looks at um, sexual maturation based on 
uh, breast size, pubic hair development, and then for the boys, the testicular size and pe uh, penile length, as well as the pubic hair. And we used a chart which we examine these patients consistently. However, we do know that 60% were already delayed, even at the start of the study. And that whereas it seemed as though they were catching up at six months, at the end of 12 months, when we looked at individual uh, Turner staging improvement, there was not a significant change. And that was when looking back at the uh, at the visit at six months. Yes, we were we compared the six months general improvement to the final twelve months improvement. Okay, so there seems to be some improvement in the beginning, but it does not last. That's if you would have been able to look longer, maybe you would have seen more. But at this moment, I think this is what you see. Am I correct? Yes, and our intention really was to follow up the adolescents for a total of 18 months. Unfortunately, the study was stopped because of lack of funding. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another question um, about yeah, the same study. Um, those people are on AR2. You, on AR2. You mentioned in your invitations that you had no control group, that you could not uh, follow a group of children who were not on ART and who were HIV infected. Of course, it wouldn't have been ethical to do so. But if you would have been able to do so in any way, um, um, how, how would you have defined the treatment effect? Um, I guess at this point we would have used an intention to treat analysis and compared those on treatment and those not on treatment. I think that would have been the best approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That would have been a way indeed to have control group. Yeah. yeah. And how would you have defined treatment effect then? Mm. I'm not sure how I'm going to answer that question. Well, the, the treatment effect would then be for those who are not on treatment, to assess their growth and development versus those who didn't, mm -hmm. who are not on treatment. But then, as we know, it wouldn't be ethical to compare the two groups because all of them need to be on treatment. It's That's a fact limitation. Yeah. yeah. But if you, if you would have a group that unintentionally is not on treatment, but it is indeed really hard to follow them uh, prospectively, it would have been retrospective. Oh, yeah. um, you could have maybe seen what, what happens to their sexual maturation because maybe it delays even more mm -hmm. than what you see now in those under ART. Perhaps, yeah. My only challenge though would have been that sexual maturation um, examination is not routinely done and so there would be missing points and looking at ret retrospective data for such a retrospective cohort would have been difficult. Yeah, I can imagine. Okay, then another bit method methodological question on the qualitative study, on study two. Uh, you used two methods there, you used uh, individual interviews and you used focus groups. Did you, say, uh, did you see any difference the way people answered when they were in the focus group or when they were interviewed individually? Yes. When people were in the focus group, they were giving broad answers. But the, the strength of the in-depth interviews for these older adolescents was that they were expressing exactly how they feel. And so I felt that the in-depth interview for me taught me that it's a, it's a way of interviewing um, to give you more information that can be individualized and not generalized. Mm -hmm. And did you have any link between both? Was it that you referred to the interviews to know the questions for the focus groups or were they just done in parallel? They were done in parallel. Okay. 
So you just use the information next to one another. And how did you select the people to get into the focus groups? Um, we we were sure to select the se the sex the sex and the mm -hmm. duration of treatment and those who are allowed to come into the focus group discussion. Yeah, you had one for boys and one for girls. Yes. And did you do anything to have a lot of variation within the group, for instance? Yes, we did. Um, we tried not to repeat. For those who had had key, uh, detailed interviews, we did include them in the focus group discussion. You did not include them in focus group. Okay. Mm -hmm. And those who were in the focus group, did they have different um, backgrounds, like different family size or different living yeah. place or these things? Yes. Um, we tried to select those who are working, those who are in school, and those who had different experiences, so that they could give mm -hmm. us a broad range of experiences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that looks sad. Um, and then the last one in your study three, you used a lot of existing skills, which is interesting, but there was one that you constructed yourself, a skill to assess self-efficacy to disclose. Uh, I wondered how you constructed this and how you tested this, if it was valid. Um, that was a very interesting thing for me to learn. First of all, I must disclose that I wasn't the first author on this paper. Uh, one of my supervisors, Professor Christiana Noslinga, who is a psychologist, had in-depth on the analysis methods for this paper. I'm not sure if I can bounce the question to her, but I do appreciate that it was an interesting um, way to, to, to do the scale, but it was based on, on studies that had been done before. Okay, so it not, was not completely coming out of nothing. I also wondered if this skill, so a skill to assess self-efficacy to disclose, if, if you could use it in practice when you give care to adolescents, to see what, what kind of intensity they need for the B groups and so on, if, would, would it be useful for that as well? I think it would, because many times we assume that adolescents are able to disclose to whomever, but actually they are not. And I think personally that self-efficacy is something that we should be promoting and looking out for. It goes with resilience, that if an adolescent has the capacity to, to stand up for themselves and tell the whole world that they are HIV infected, then they are more resilient and able to cope with being HIV infected. So I think this is something that we could promote and emphasize moving forward. Yeah. Well, that brings me to, to my last and bit more global uh, question. Would, would you have started in your own studies is the individual care uh, and how it impacts on, on, on those adolescents' lives? But there is, as, as, as you showed in your bigger model, there is also the, the big factor of your, your, your context, your social context, your uh, society, in fact, where those children live in and which have to give them chances and should not um, stigmatize them too much. Is there anything you think you can do in, in, in that part of the model as well? Mm. Well, in, in the... I, I think yes, that... I'm, I'm afraid we don't hear you anymore. I'm, I'm so sorry, I'd okay. muted. <laughs> no problem, thanks. I, I said that if, and now I've forgotten the question because it's, I've really forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't really, well, looking to the, to the complete picture, uh, you, you described the picture of the adolescents themselves and what they can integrate in themselves, but there is also the other, Find the society which which might better achieve those better um, surround those children. And is there anything that you can do out of your research or out of your center to do something to society and how they look at HIV infected adolescents? Oh yes, yeah. Um, I think one of the things that we can do is to destigmatize HIV because we now know that HIV is a chronic illness; it is manageable. 
and that when these adolescents are cared for well in the communities, then they will more likely adhere to their treatment. There are various things that the adolescents themselves have done, including like having um, a beauty contest, a beauty contest to show that living with HIV is not the end of the world, that they can survive even in their communities. So I guess it's going to take a lot of um, political and, and even senior management support to enable the reduction in stigma. But also I think that self-stigma expressed by the adolescents themselves needs to be reduced. And that if they know that even though they are HIV infected, they can survive and no one is going to talk ill of them or discriminate against them, I think it will be easier. Okay, many thanks. These were my questions. I hope I left some space for Professor Lukivit. Yeah, thank you, because you did, and I hope is that Professor uh, Lukivit has joined here. Yes, yes. Uh, will you hear me now? Yes. Yes, yes. Perfect. Okay, thank you. I'm very sorry, huh? Uh, so I, uh, I was trying to manage, and uh, so I had the first uh, question, so I hope there will not be too much similar. So first, congratulations, Sabrina, and uh, uh, for the, for your thesis, for your nice presentation, uh, everything. And so I, I promise I won't ask any methodological question. I think I think you had enough. Um, so um, I will go in the order of the, the paper. So first, um, I was wondering uh, whether uh, delays, frequency, uh, or sexual maturation is still a problem that you. Uh, meet now in, in the other. Okay. Um, thank you very much. As you know now, we do the test and treat strategy, and that adolescents and, and children in general are started on treatment much earlier. So we don't see delayed sexual maturation anymore, or perhaps we need to repeat the study because. This study was done 14 years ago. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, now, is it difficult uh, um, disclosure to, to uh, uh, others? Uh, when the child is vertically infected, disclosed his status, he also disclosed his mother's status. Uh, was it a concern that was raised by the, in the focus group and uh, by the Okay, um, so just to, to step back, we know that it's the mothers who disclose their own HIV status to the adolescents, and they do assisted disclosure. So by the time an adolescent gets to know that they are HIV infected, they need to be supported to understand that they got it from mother to child, and so that is not a problem. The ones who have problems, though, are the ones who are behaviorally infected. And they showed very clearly that they were afraid to tell their parents about their HIV status. And I did show a quotation from one of them who said that disclosing to their parents was like sending their parents to die. So they didn't want to tell yeah. their parents. Mm. Thank you. But my question was whether when you choose to stay a friend or partner that you offer this when you are vertically infected, mm -hmm. you tell your status, but you also tell the status of the mother. Oh yes. And maybe he, he is not happy with that. So is that a uh, problem then? Oh yeah. I we actually never ask that question. It's something that we could ask one of our master's students to to do because disclosing to others means you coincidentally disclosing your parents' status, which may not be fair. So thank you, Dr. Tessa, for that question. We'll pass it on to our master's students. Okay. Uh, now, just a question about your uh, feeling of uh, what's the best age to uh, tell a child if uh, it's infected and how, how do you do that? Uh, what's the process of uh, disclosure of that stage? So we have a national policy where we generally support disclosure to the child by the age of 10. 
And this is important because now they are becoming adolescents and they are likely not to adhere to their treatment. So we generally tell them by the age of 10 and we encourage the parents to be the ones to tell them. If the parents cannot tell them, then we ask the counselor to be the one to tell them. And you start by giving them pieces of homework, what is HIV, do you know anyone who has HIV? And by the time you tell them they are on HIV status, they are more comfortable and they understand. Good. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the time of your study uh, uh, had it an influence on, on uh, the way they would disclose their death status, the, the, the age they were informed, or uh, did you look at that? Uh, yes, um, like I said, the majority had known that they were HIV infected. The average was about three and a half years, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, about the, the focus group uh, you did on the sexual risk reduction, uh, I don't think, maybe I need it, uh, you talked about other where uh, STD accounts in this uh, children except by pre-infection of HIV, other STD were they released at the uh, we actually did not look for other STDs. Now we are able to do that. So the STDs we typically look for are syphilis and gonorrhea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But my question was, is it a concern for, for the, the, the young uh, children or the adolescents? Uh, are they, do they feel the STD? Are they aware of uh, other STDs? Um, well, in some studies that have been done in this country, the knowledge of STD transmission is, is rather low. It's about 40%. And I know that uh, people like uh, Lina Tuyambe and others have done studies in this area. And the Gottmacha Institute have also looked at information regarding adolescents in general in this country. Their knowledge is not very high. Okay. Mm. I'm almost done. Um, I was just curious about, you know, the Swiss concept, U equal U, and the technical equal, uh, and uh, some Is it a message you give to your adolescents, or is it always protection for them? And, uh, um. We actually use that concept of U equals U, undetectable equals untransmissible. And yeah, we are seeing in our older cohorts that adolescents are actually getting married into discordant um, relations. So the U equals U is something that we are looking at seriously. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. It's, uh, it's great to be to inviting uh, the supervisors if they have any more questions to the to Sabrina. Oh, that's uh, Coleman, is he still there? Uh... Yes, there are no other questions. <laughs> <laughs> No, okay, comprehensive questions that were asked. And Professor Rizzo, okay? No, no. I have no, 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 no questions. No questions. No questions. No questions. <laughs> As you know, this is also a public defense, uh, which means that the audience normally should have the opportunity to ask questions. Of course, with the virtual meeting, it's more difficult. So if anyone would like to address a question to Sabrina can do so. Uh, please use the hand raised button and send your question by chat. The other chat channel. Professor, there are some people in this room who would like to ask questions as well. Yeah. Should they come up to here where the mic is? Yes, uh, please invite them to, to join you. Then, uh, so okay. you can send by chat. Okay. Professor Philippa will ask them to read. Please come, uh, Dr. Flavia. And then, uh, <laughs>
using this uh, Congratulations, Dr. Sabrina, and thank you very much. I just uh, wanted to, I had two questions for you, or clarifications from you. Are uh, among your cohort, do you think that knowing early for a child, say we disclose, we start preparing this child to disclose by say 10 years, they actually know their disclosure. I mean, they know their status. Does that improve their disclosure later? And then uh, secondly, I wanted to know oh. if you, among your cohort, those that are in school would disclose better than those that are not. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Flavia. So the first question was, if we tell these adolescents early, like the, at the age of 10, are they more likely to disclose to other people? It, it, it doesn't really matter. Like we said in our studies, the self-efficacy is dependent a lot on whether they have social support, whether they are living on their own, whether they are older. So it's an individual thing at most. The other is, if the adolescent is in school, are they more likely to disclose? No. When adolescents are in school, there's a lot of bullying, there's a lot of stigmatization and discrimination, so they are more likely not to tell anybody. Thank you, Dr. Solomon. Uh, congratulations, Sabrina. I'm very proud of you. I have a question that's been touched on uh, earlier. And this is about the pubertal delay. I'm just wondering, yes, the grant funding stopped, but this court continues to be with you. What have you really observed? And then the, the, the study was done in 2006. I imagine at that time, viral load wasn't um, very present. So it's not surprising that perhaps you saw um, improvements in well, people being on treatment, no improvement in CD4, but then perhaps the viral load had been suppressed. What are your thoughts about this? And then I like to go into like understanding the biochemistry. So what do you think is happening? Why is there, why was there pubertal display? What is the mechanism of the pubertal this, uh, delay? And the growth improved, everything improved. What actually happened? What does HIV do to architecture? And uh, was it because of the type of drugs they were on? And has that changed today? For me, I'd I, I like to have some clarification around that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sabrina. Dr. Sabrina will well, answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So there are two questions, really. Um, one is on the physiology of pubertal growth. We know that puberty is, is sparked off by... There are two theories. There's the leptin theory, and then some people also think it's a nutrition. A lot of our patients were chronically ill. The cohort that we studied was severely immunocompromised. They were mostly in WHO stage four and, and three. So they were chronically ill. And we know that severe malnutrition and the majority of our patients were moderately severely malnourished. They therefore had um, reduced kispeptin and then also their weight was low. So it did not help them to mount an, a response to spark of puberty. When they were started on treatment, we expected them to grow and gain weight and, and, and height, but their height did not improve really. And again, their body mass in index did not improve significantly. So that still affected their long-term sexual maturation rates. The cohort is still present, but even by the time of 12 months, we had sadly lost six of our patients. We could look back into the data because the PIDC has an electronic database and just look at the specific cohort that we followed because we do still have their data and just see how they eventually mature. But now the average age of these individuals is like 22 to 26 years. So some of them have had children, so I guess they are sexually mature. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> What about CD4 virus? Oh yes, um, so the question on the CD4 counts, 
They did have a robust response to antiretroviral therapy, and irrespective of their level of severity of immunosuppression, they had a good rebound, and they improved over the course of 12 months. Their viral loads were suppressed, and we looked at viral suppression as less than 400 copies per meal to say severe immunosuppression. Today we are looking at zero. So if we were to repeat this study, perhaps we would have different results. Thank you. And I, I think Professor Lina Tuyambe has his hand up. His hand has been up all the time. Uh, I, I think his hand is still up. Professor Lina Tuyambe. There's someone else in the room who would like to ask a question. Yes, I see several of uh, 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 I'm not able to read to see a text message. Uh, uh, if they want to ask a question, either they should come forward or send uh, a message via the chat uh, channel. Did I see that somebody is uh, coming from us come forward? Please present yourself and the uh, questions. Uh, my name is Jane Wanyama. I'm an alumni of uh, Antwerp, Belgium. Yeah. Happy to see Professor Kolevanders, my supervisor. Congratulations, Dr. Sabrina. Um, of late, I've picked interest in two implementation research. And the emphasis is that the end user the respondents benefit from the research that we've done. Have you thought about interventions to address some of the challenges you identified with the young people that you are looking at? And then still in the vein of implementation research, have you thought how about you know proper stakeholder engagement? For example, having the right you know stakeholders on board, the policy makers to ensure that the nice research we do reaches the final users. Those are my two questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jane Wanyama. Dr. Jane Wanyama is actually an alumni of the ITM, and I'm glad that you're here. I'm also a, a scholar of implementation science. I may not be at your level. I've just had two classes of implementation science, but I'm sure by the end of the year, I'll be a guru in implementation science. And just for you to know, a lot of our research has actually in, been included in policy documents. As you know, we were part of the group that wrote the WHO guidelines for adolescents of 2016, and a lot of our work was included in those policies. Today we now know that disclosure is an important attribute to improving adherence, and that parents must are mandated to disclose their HIV status to their HIV-infected adolescents because it improves adherence. Already we are practicing what we studied and what we are promoting. In terms of the intervention, we, look, we were looking at positive prevention as an intervention, and we described positive prevention as being aware of their HIV status, adhering well to treatment, and also reducing onward transmission of HIV. So, the clinic where I work at Baylor, Uganda, we are already practicing this. But on a larger stakeholder engagement, I am very happy that more than 100 people actually listen to this defense. I think this is a, a way of disseminating this information, but strategically, we should be able to present it at the national level. One of my supervisors, Professor Philip Amsoke, is a national ART chairperson, so I'm sure that we have stakeholder um, a stakeholder manifest <laughs> to promote this research. Thank you so much. Okay. So that too. See, uh, 
the hand raised of Professor Moses Carmilla, is he there? Uh, James Turnwine. The three people, Professor Kamiya, Professor Tumine, and Professor Sarah Sassi, Sarah I'm not sure if they can hear, but Professor Moses Kamiya has been allowed to ask a question, Professor Tumine and Professor Sarah Sali. Please ask your questions. You ask them to type their, their question. So I'm afraid that we have uh, no possibility to to have the open and the I do not see any message or chance or mm -hmm. we can uh, leave those questions uh, and others uh, later on and uh, just the uh, jury will uh, withdraw and uh, discuss uh, the, we are already one hour busy after this presentation because uh, we have a very interesting discussion and questioning and uh, I think it's now time for the jury to withdraw and to discuss uh, the presentation and the details by Sabrina. So uh, we will come back in a couple of minutes uh, with the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I suppose that we are now alone, just uh, the members of the jury, or uh, uh, all the others still. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.